Welcome to our Think Tank 2022 public uh, lecture series. Uh, this month, we have a great uh, pleasure uh, to have uh, Dr. Natida Chantima uh, joining us uh, on the topic which is very relevant to today's world, which is the contribution of international humanitarian law to peace and conflict resolutions. Uh, Dr. Nat has just received her PhD from City University of London. Uh, her research focuses on international uh, humanitarian law, international politics and security, law on the use of force, responsibility to protect, and Southeast Asian approach to international law. Currently, she uh, holding several positions, including uh, an assistant editor at the Legal Issue Journal, a uh, research uh, fellow at the Mekong Center for Strategic Study at the Asian Vision Institute, also research fellow at the Think Tank 2022 Asia Pacific Secretariat, and also researcher at the Information Research Analyst Group of the Cambodia Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Corporations. So uh, this is really indeed uh, our pleasure to, to have you here with us, Dr. Ned, and uh, uh, we are looking forward to your lecture on the, the role of humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, especially in the context of a very volatile uh, world today, a very kind of uh, uh, dangerous world indeed. Uh, that uh, many civilians still are uh, suffering from war and conflicts. And of course, the objective of international uh, humanitarian law is to protect uh, the civilians, to protect those who are not in fighting. Uh, and of course, as we all know, uh, the war and conflicts, either interstate war or intrastate war, have caused uh, tremendous suffering to civilians. And now uh, the international human law also under stress. Uh, some country have violated, uh, some armed groups have violated human laws. So now we have a, a opportunity to listen to Dr. Ned to explain us more about uh, what is human law, international human law, why does it matter in peace and conflict uh, reconciliation. So uh, Dr. Ned, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Van Rudd, and uh, good afternoon, everyone in Cambodia. Good morning from London. It is an honor um, for me to speak um, in this uh, program. Thank you so much for having me. So as we all know, the question today is how can the, um, how can international humanitarian law contribute to peace and recon reconciliation in armed conflict? As we all know, international humanitarian law, as you have said, usually deals with, um, re regulates the conducts of states and non-state actors in armed conflict, having little or nothing to do with peace. International humanitarian law, otherwise also known as the law of armed conflict, seeks to regulate the conducts of state and individual participants in armed conflict to protect people and property. International humanitarian law essentially seeks to balance between the two twin objectives of the need of armed forces of a state or non-state groups to prosecute the armed conflict and also the humanitarian need to protect those who do not or no longer wish to take direct parts in the hostilities. International humanitarian law general frameworks are laid out in the four Geneva Conventions in their three additional protocols. Mm -hmm. The first convention regards the protection of the wounded and sick and armed forces in the field. Second convention regards the same protection but at sea. Third convention regards the treatment of prisoners of war. Fourth convention regards the protection of civilian persons in times of war. Whereas the additional protocol one relates to the protection of victims in international armed conflict, Protocol 2 relates to the protection of victims in non-international armed conflicts. And Protocol 3 relates to the adoption of additional distinctive emblem. Initially, international humanitarian law only regulated the conduct of states in international conflicts. However, in the last few decades, as we have seen, non-international armed conflicts are much higher in numbers 
than the traditional state versus state wars, hence the additional protocol too. While there are different agreed upon numbers of fundamental principles of the law of armed conflict, through my research, there are a number of principles that stands out, which includes the principles of distinction, military necessity, proportionality, prohi prohibition on unnecessary suffering and superfluous injury. The order of importance, of course, differs with different state practice. The principle of distinction states that in order to respect for and protect the civilian populations and objects, the parties to the armed conflict shall at all times distinguish between the civilian population and combatants and between civilian objects and military objectives and accordingly shall direct their operations only against military objectives. This has been described as one of the cardinal principles of the international humanitarian law. The principle of military necessity requires that the parties to the conflict adopt only those measures necessary to weaken enemy, the enemy and achieve their goal. It is not necessary to bring about the total destruction of the enemy, its armed forces or property. The principle of proportionality. The violation of this principle would mean that an attack which may expect to cause incidental loss of civilian lives injury to civilians, damage to civilian object, objects, or a combination thereof, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. International humanitarian law also prohibits the use and methods of warfare that would result in superfluous injury or unnecessary sufferings, such as chemical, biological, or poison or nuclear weapons. So how can international humanitarian law be implemented? As of today, a total of 196 states are signatories to the four Geneva Conven Conventions I've, I've mentioned, in which they have responsibilities and obligation to ensure that their conduct meets with the standards of international humanitarian law. They could do so even during peacetime by disseminating the principles mentioned to their armed forces and civil societies. States could also codify the international humanitarian law principles into their domestic constitutions, which would hopefully further incentivize their armed forces to comply with the principles when it's time to act in armed conflicts. The Geneva Convention also make provision for the creation of an ad hoc international mission to make inquiries into any alleged breaches of the Geneva Convention and for the commission to assist and help settle any disputes or disagreements between the parties involved. Another step to ensure that international humanitarian law is properly implemented is to investigate and prosecute individuals who violate the principles through either civilian or military court at domestic or international level with the International Criminal Court under the Rome Statute. Lastly, those who violate the international humanitarian laws are also obligated to make reparations for victims of the armed conflicts. As I have discussed about the fundamentals and implementation of humanitarian law. There's yet to be any mention or connection to peacemaking, which leads us to the second part of this presentation. The second part, I will discuss how the principles of international humanitarian law can be applied to peacemaking processes. And I will be comparing three case studies to see how international humanitarian law is applied or is challenged in the cases of Colombia, Libya, and Myanmar. So how can international humanitarian law contribute to peacemaking? Peace is much more readily restored if it is not also necessary to overcome the hatred between peoples invariably spawn and most certainly exacerbated by violations of international humanitarian law. Furthermore, according to Elizabeth Salmon, while reconciliation is not a specific objective of, I, of international humanitarian law, it is an indirect result of its effective enforcement. Also, from a realist point of view, the legal obligation is usually not enough as a driving force for states to comply with international humanitarian law standards. 
but rather stems from the party's state or non-state self-interest, which may be to improve their reputation, legitimacy, image, and in the hopes of reciprocal behavior. Essentially, how can you expect your adversary to respect the principles of international humanitarian law if the party itself violates those rules? Furthermore, usually in non-international armed conflicts, government like to label their adversary as terrorist groups in order to delegitimize de de their cause and image and to be able to claim to the international community that the armed conflict is merely an internal unrest and tension situation so that the situation does not sound that it amounts to the international humanitarian law standard of a non-international armed conflict, which usually in their opinion gives them the right to respond however they want, never mind that their response might violate international humanitarian law principles. Moreover, by labeling the other parties as terrorists, it can exclude them from peace negotiations and might even tempt the non-state group to violate international humanitarian law further in order to get themselves recognized by the government or international community since they have nothing to lose, essentially. On the other hand, if the government recognizes other parties to the conflict, they are more likely to be open to dialogues and peacemaking processes. A good example of how international humanitarian law can facilitate the road to peace in to peace to armed conflict is between the Colombian is, is between the revolutionary armed conflicts. Uh, excuse me, between the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia versus the Colombian armed forces between 1964 to 2016. At the time, the guerrilla group was the largest and oldest armed group in Colombia. And the fact that they are able to conclude a lasting peace agreement with the government is quite historical. Between 2011, the guerrilla group was labeled as a terrorist group by the government, and they were to be dealt with under domestic laws. The guerrilla operations were funded by kidnapping, extortion, illegal mining, production, and distribution of illegal drugs. The group even argued most of the times that states only adopted international humanitarian law for their own convenience, and rather than humanizing war, the group wished to end it. Peace between the two parties could not be reached until the new government at the time, headed by Juan Manuel Santos, recognized the existence of that non-international armed conflict and invoked international humanitarian law as a framework moving forward. In November 2012, just after the official debut of the peace talks, the guerrilla group sent a letter to the International Community of Committee of Red Cross expressing that although they did not describe to any international humanitarian law instruments, it had been committed to respecting its principles aimed at protecting civilians, as long as principles were in accordance with the group's precarious possibilities of resistance under a symmetry of armed conflict. In particular, the latter expressed the guerrilla group acknowledgments of the importance of the Geneva Convention and their additional protocols. Then the guerrilla asked for as the Red Cross in this letter to serve as a channel to consider the very negotiation agenda as a special agreement. At this point, the guerrilla group might have been motivated by wanting to gain legitimacy from the public and international community. They might have wanted to distance themselves from its earlier criminal acts that have terrorized the civilian populations. They have may also wanted to be met with amnesties at the end of the conflict and eliminated the risk of being tried for war crimes and other international crimes. Peace negotiations began and by 2016, the two parties signed a peace agreement that ended the armed conflict. The guerrilla group disarmed themselves to the UN and reformed itself as a legal political party and the Colombian government agreed to grant the broadest possible amnesties for its conduct related to the conflict, despite being criminal offenses under domestic law, but do not constitute violations of international humanitarian law that could amount to war crimes. After the signing of the agreement, the two parties even agreed to cooperate in the removal of landmines in order to protect the civilians living in the rural areas. 
Furthermore, the two parties also joined forces in searching for the people reported missing as a result of the armed conflict. As part of the agreement, the guerrilla agreed re to release children under the age of 15 from their camps and vowed to no longer recruit person under 18 with the aim of restoring children's rights. These gestures and operations were part of their trust building measures in order to build long lasting peace between the two parties. This Colombian case shows the willingness of both parties to the conflict to apply to international humanitarian law to facilitate peace and put an end to their conflict. Now, on the other hand, I will turn to discuss the case study where international humanitarian law is deeply challenged to, uh, to be implemented as a roadmap to peace, starting with Libya. As we all know, since the demise of the Gaddafi regime in 2011, Libya has been embroiled in a state of constant political unrest and armed conflicts. Since then, there are overlapping ongoing non-international armed conflicts in the country. The one that stands out the most is between the UN-recognized government of national court headed by Abdul Hamid Dibaiba as prime minister against Fatih Bashaga appointed by the Libyan House of Representatives. Since 2016, according to a UN fact-finding mission, violations of international humanitarian law, specifically the principles of proportionality and distinction, crime against humanity and war crimes have been found to have been committed by both parties as well as their foreign counterparts. Although a ceasefire agreement was reached in 2020, which called for the withdrawal of all foreign forces within 90 days, suspension, suspension of military training, the identification and ca categorization of all militia, monitor the ceasefire, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration of the militia, and confidence building measures between the two that includes prisoner exchange and in hate speech, and travel to open between the west and east parts of Libya. It, unfortunately, it did not last. With the two proclaimed prime ministers warring and refusing to recognize each other's authorities, the two constantly accuses each other of igniting civil wars. Fighting resumed as of August 2022. 22, just last month, which even prompted the UN Security Council to release a statement calling for all parties to respect the international humanitarian law regarding the protection of civilians, in which Libya is signatory to the Geneva Convention. The Security Council further urged the all parties to refrain from violence that could escalate tension into a full-blown civil war. And the Security Council also called all parties to agree to deliver a presidential and parliamentary election across the country. However, since then, there has been no progress in this non-international armed conflict. To both parties refuses to abide by the standards of international humanitarian law. Next, I will turn to the last case study of this presentation, which is Myanmar. Myanmar is a culturally and ethnically diverse country deeply embroiled in multiple non-international armed conflicts with multiple ethnic armed groups such as the Kachin Independence Army, Ta'ang National Liberation Army, Arakan Army, Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army in the regions of Rakhine State, Kachin, and Shan State. Perhaps the campaign that the Myanmar Armed Forces, Tatmadaw, is most known for is in Rakhine State against the Rohingya population and the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army between 2016 and 2017. Tatmadaw claimed that it was conducting a clearance, a lawful clearance military operations against a terrorist group. The government claimed that this was merely an internal communal violence rather than a non-international armed conflict. According to the 2018 report of the UN Human Rights Commission fact-finding mission, the Tatmadaw had committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and enough evidence to accuse the senior officials for genocide too. 
Furthermore, it also looked like the Tamadao violated the funda fundamental principles of international humanitarian law of proportionality, distinction, and unnecessary sufferings in their clearance operations against the Rohingya and civilian populations in Rakhine State. To complicate this situation further, the group is still labeled as a terrorist group today, and Rohingya is still not recognized by the Myanmar government. And as of February 2021, General Min Aung Liang, head of the Tamadao, orchestrated a coup against the president and state councillor, leaving the Rohingya crisis along with many other non-international ethnic armed conflict unresolved. Since the coup, the UN reported that the Tatmadaw had been engaged in, in systematic violations of humanitarian law and human rights, also amounting to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The Tatmadaw has been blatantly targeting the civilian populations, disregarding the principles of international humanitarian law. Even with ASEAN and its members and other members of the international community offered to assist Myanmar, Myanmar has shown very little effort and willingness to implement the five-point consensus produced by ASEAN, which includes calls for halting violence, calls for all parties to commence constructive dialogues to seek a peaceful resolution, a special ASEAN envoy to facilitate mediation of the dialogue process, and that ASEAN shall provide humanitarian assistance. <clears throat> The special envoy shall meet with all parties concerned. Not only that the Tatmadaw have not started to implement the five-point consensus, the situation seems to worsen with the ex execution of the prisoners just in July this year. With these developments, it also starts to escalate the existing tensions once again with the various ethnic armed groups such as the Kachin Independence Army, Karen National Union, and Shan State Army. These groups vowed to protect the people, civilian population, in their anti-military movement in an offensive military matter if need be. Until now, Tatmadaw has made no efforts to restore peace and stability in the country, even after the international community condemns the government for violating various aforementioned international law. After having discussed the three case studies and the fundamental of international humanitarian law, it goes to show that the contribution of international humanitarian law to peace and reconciliation of conflict to conflict is met with more challenges than prospects. That is because, in my opinion, there are no super authority in the international community to act as an impartial body that can bring states who violate international humanitarian law and other international law to justice. At the moment, although non-states are become non-state actors are becoming more of a significant actor in, in the international community, states are still the main actors. And in my opinion, from a realist stance, if the state aligns itself with the right superpower, merely, namely one of the permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, then the state's action would more or less go unchecked since they are backed by the right actor in the international community. International com humanitarian law can only work and be successfully implemented as a tool for peacemaking if the parties involved are willing to implement it like the example of Colombia. But if they are not, then we are left with the question of who is to enforce these laws. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Netida Chantima for very comprehensive and insightful, uh, informative uh, presentation on uh, the challenges that we have, that humanitarian, international uh, humanitarian law is facing and uh, from your presentation, uh, as you argue ask, ask that uh, the challenges is is mounting, uh, and the prospect is quite gloomy, a bit <laughs> uh, gloomy. Um, so that is very unfortunate international development uh, with regards to what we always call the international order based on the international law, and uh, humanitarian law is part of that international law that we need to. 
respect uh, and adhere to in order to protect the uh, civilians and use it as a as kind of mechanism for peace and conflict uh, reconciliation in the armed conflict. So uh, my, my question to you first, if it regards to, uh, you mentioned about some country may uh, have this kind of uh, uh, integration of uh, humanitarian laws, especially the four uh, Geneva Convention that you mentioned into domestic constitutions. So when when it, international law, like humanitarian international law, have been integrated into domestic constitution, so the enforcement mechanism can be at two levels, right? Uh, the national yes. law and international level. So yes. from, from your perspective, this kind of integration of international humanitarian law and the domestic constitution, um, in terms of the enforcement, um, what, what are the challenges and what are the lessons learned so far? Um, through my re thank you for that question. Um, through my research, I international law, as we all know, is made mostly by Western states, which could which poses as a challenge to other states in other regions of the world to implement um, accordingly into their domestic constitution. So, in order to implement these rules accordingly to domestic laws and to be enforced if um, enforced um, efficiently in my opinion i think these rules should also take in, into account um, regional differences and national differences as well in that way then each country can um, almost customize it into their own um, constitutions and then their own style of enforcement and of course, um, when there are similarities in the region, then states as a group could work together as well, such as, for example, ASEAN states, which we are quite similar in certain ways, we could assist each other in, to help implement these international humanitarian law into regional and national mechanisms in order to enforce it efficiently. Thank you. You also raised about the state and non-state actors here with regards to the enforcement of uh, international humanitarian law. Of course, it uh, mainly it aim to target state actors, not, not the non-state actors. So there's a gray zone here with regards to what we call state-sponsored terrorist group. State-sponsored state terrorist group, is it a state actor or non-state actor? I, in my opinion, it is both. Because like you said, if it is sponsored, if it is... Um, acting on behalf of the state, then of course it is state. Um, state uh, it is half a state actor, but at the same time, if it's separate, then it is non-state actor. Then yes, it is heading into that gray area where which law would apply uh, would apply to that group since it is both. Mm -hmm. but, but it's quite very challenging and tricky here. Yes, yeah, very very challenging, and as we've all seen in a lot of conflicts that are going on today, most actors display both characteristics um, that it is partly state-sponsored, but it is its own actor as well. So yes, I agree, it is quite complicated, this area. Yeah, uh, another thing is uh, with regard to the, the allegation or accusation of a uh, double standard uh, being practiced by certain countries when it comes to international humanitarian law. So. So now we are in the context of uh, this kind of geopolitical rivalry and competitions between major powers and a lot of gray areas and gray zones and, and double standard uh, uh, are going to be implemented more extensively. So how does uh, the practice of uh, double standard affect uh, the meaning and uh, impact of international humanitarian law? As I have mentioned just now, and yes, it is rather um, a bleak view of um, the future going forward. But yes, in this time of uncertainties because of um, superpowers rivalries, international humanitarian law and other international laws plays a very small part. It, event, it essentially depends on the actor's willingness to implement it. And that depends on the actor's willingness to when to implement it, how to implement it. Because as I have said, there is no 
impartial super authority that could bring these states that chooses when and how to implement these rules to justice if they don't comply by these rules. So essentially international law and international humanitarian law could only do so much if the state is not willing to implement it. Thank you. There's also a question from Nana Lee uh, via Facebook, a uh, bit also relate to the previous question. Uh, uh, is, she said that some conflicts uh, involve the support from the superpower. How can the international humanitarian law be enforced if there are conflict of interest between the superpower? Let's say at the UN Security Council, there's no consensus for instance, a veto power there. So that, that is question. Uh, seek your comments on that. Yes, um, thank you for that question. Um, that question is uh, relevant to the two conflicts that I have mentioned, which is Libya and Myanmar. The security, as well as Syria, Syria in my opinion, this conflict is, these conflicts have been protracted for years because the UN Security Council has been gridlocked. Each party is backed by either one of the at least one of the superpower in the permanent member of the Security Council. With these warring parties at the highest level of international community, these parties, are, um, these conflicts, excuse me, are gridlocked. International humanitarian law and other international law is, again, essentially becomes useless if they refuses to implement it due to their own interests or their own motives therefore they they are not putting um, the standards or principle of international humanitarian law at the top of their decision making rather than self-interest and that is just from a realist point of view that any of the day states will only act uh, in accordance to their motives and self-interest so yes. unfortunately these in my opinion again I don't see these um, conflicts ending anytime soon because yeah. of that. But very unfortunate. Uh, perhaps very, that is a, very the, 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 sad, the sad truths that we are facing uh, with regards to this kind of selfish national interest over the global common goods and, and humanitarian kind of uh, uh, interest, humanity yes. interest. So, uh, but we still have hope uh, because we are, we are talking here today because we still have hope. And you mentioned about uh, International uh, Committee on Red Cross, for instance, uh, which has done a tremendous uh, role uh, so far uh, to uh, protect uh, the rights and dignity of civilian, uh, yes. those uh, 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 who are not in fighting. Uh, it, it, I mean, the, even the soldier that they are no longer in fighting, uh, yes. they need to protect uh, them as well. So, so let uh, 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 she has uh, your view on on the role of these non-governmental organizations such as the uh, ICRC in uh, protecting uh, civilians uh, in armed conflicts. I mean, um, these non-governmental organizations can play a very important role in when it comes to assisting humanitarian crisis. However, again, we're back to the other point that I've made, but it again depends on how much the state allows these non-organization to act or to be involved. At the end of the day, because it is under their sovereignty, um, whatever conflict that is going on, these non-international, this non excuse me, this non-governmental organization does not have the power to enforce peacemaking or enforce <clears throat> humanitarian um, operations uh, forcefully if the state doesn't agree to. In, in, in this regard, you also mentioned about the image or reputations of the country or the state actor. So perhaps that is what we call it, uh, a kind of a, a moral uh, image pressure on the state to, to implement international uh, human twin law. So that, does it matter, does it count uh, when it comes to the state behavior or response to uh, this kind of humanitarian issues during the armed conflict? Yes, in my opinion, it um, it is very important. But again, if there is a non-international armed conflict between an armed group or uh, and versus the state's forces, 
if that state, again, is backed by a superpower and one of the P5 of the United Nation, it might not care about what others think of them if they have the right state to back them up. Or if they themselves, if that superpower, for example, Russia, it does not seem to care what others in the international community thinks of them. Myanmar being backed, having close relationship with China and Russia as well, does not seem to care about what the rest of the international community or the US thinks of them. So that depends on individual cases and individual states of where they stand in the international community to, to, for us to analyze how much they think about their image and how that would influence their de decision making. Thank you, very, very interesting. So of course there's some room to play here, but um, uh, at least uh, let the history tell the story or tell the truth. Yes. Um, okay, uh, we, we move on to another question with regards to the, you mentioned earlier about the peacekeeping operations. Uh, uh, many Southeast Asian countries have contributed significant numbers of peacekeeping forces under the framework of the United Nations. Cambodia uh, also very active in, in sending its peacekeeping forces. So uh, look at the capacity and knowledge of these peacekeeping forces with regards to humanitarian law, because they need to understand uh, international humanitarian law in their operation overseas under the framework of UN. So um, you look at the capacity and uh, what are the gaps that, that we need to uh, fill in in these uh, peacekeeping operations? I think, uh, well, first, I think uh, um, the fact that countries that um, allows their forces to be um, to contribute to peacekeeping operation, it really helps with their image and legitimacy as well to show the international community that they are um, cooperative as a player in the international community. I think to bridge that gap, as I have mentioned before, one way that international humanitarian law could be implemented you could do so even during peacetime. As such, when you are sending your forces overseas for peacekeeping missions, before that, you could do um, an educational program for your armed forces, for your civil societies, in order to disseminate this information and these standards to them so that they will act out when they are carrying out their missions overseas, even during peacetime. I think that way then slowly um, the principle of humanitarian law could be implemented from a national um, stage. Yeah, that, that is a very, very, I think, interesting point uh, to build the capacity of, uh, let's say, the peacekeeping forces from Southeast Asia or ASEAN peacekeep peacekeepers, uh, because we really don't talk much at the regional level when it comes to uh, international humanitarian law. And the knowledge of this, I think it's quite limited uh, among the policymakers across the region. So that is something that we, we need to do more, I think, in terms of promoting awareness uh, among the policymakers as well as, well as the general public about the uh, humanitarian uh, law, because it is very important uh, when it comes to uh, war and armed conflicts, uh, because at the end of the day, is about human dignity and human rights and to protect the civilians. Um, with regards to Myanmar, uh, come back to Myanmar a bit on uh, uh, displacement, displaced person, uh, displacement issue has become very serious now. Uh, more than 1 million, according to UN's report, uh, have been displaced in Myanmar. And some, of course, take, take uh, refuge or become refugees in neighboring countries. Um, and it seems that uh, the state actor here, it be the Tamadao or the the TAC, uh, uh, the SAC, uh, the SAC, uh, has not effectively responded to this kind of humanitarian crisis. Uh, so, uh, should the state actor be held accountable uh, when it comes to this kind of displaced uh, persons? In my opinion, yes, they should be held accountable. However, again, who is to hold them accountable? I mean, in theory, um, yes, they should be held accountable. I mean, the um, state, well, the previous state council, Aung San Suu Kyi, even uh, went to court on this matter. However, if they refuses to follow the um, court's judgment or the international community um, 
suggestions to make reparations for these victims to receive these um, refugees back to their um, homeland or to make uh, any sort of solution at all. Essentially, again, it is a bleak view, but it is still up to them. Nobody can force them to um, willingly receive these refugees back into Myanmar. Yes, um, it's very uh, dire situation there when it comes to humanitarian crisis. And as yes. you said, uh, uh, that uh, who going to enforce this kind of humanitarian law? Uh, uh, all, although, the, uh, as you mentioned your uh, presentation, that the United Nations have uh, produced several reports uh, with regards to war crimes and crimes uh, against humanity, which have been uh, happening uh, in uh, Myanmar, uh, but the uh, internal enforcement is still uh, limited. And uh, you also mentioned that perhaps uh, Myanmar thinks that due to their strong relation with Moscow and China, which is a two uh, member of the Security Council at the UN, it, it may be safe to uh, to behave what they are, what they have been doing. Yes. So that that is perhaps the, their thinking and calculation decision making there. So uh, Colombia is, according to my understanding, your 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 presentation of case Colombia is quite a a, a good case, right? Uh, in uh, it's kind of a successful case, which uh, both parties, I mean uh, conflicting parties, uh, have adopted or approached the humanitarian law and use it as a mechanism for peace and reconciliation. So that yes. uh, can uh, perhaps elaborate a bit more on why, why it was a, a success uh, story in the case of Colombia. I mean, although it, now that we talk about it, it is a success sto uh, story. Don't forget that it, the conflict started since 1964. It only ended in 2016. So that was decades of fighting between the two. And of course, civilian populations were affected. I think, in my opinion, of course, throughout those decades, there are changes in leaderships on both sides of the guerrilla group and on the government as well. It was only because there were the right leader for both sides at the right time that they both agreed to work together. Essentially, when the Colombian government recognized them as, an, uh, as a group rather than a terrorist group, and that started to pave the way into peacemaking. Again, the guerrilla group started to change their thinking that rather to terrorize civilian populations to get the government to give them what they want. They wanted to gain favors from the public. They wanted to gain their legitimacy. So it was a case of the right actors at the right time working together. So here, uh, leadership matters, uh, I think. Of course. Yeah, leadership matters. So. Uh, we hope to see uh, leadership change in certain yes. countries and conflict yes. zones <laughs> that yes. uh, we could see uh, a brighter or, I mean, ho more hopeful uh, scenario for, for the humanitarian yes. uh, situation there. Um, of course, there's uh, talking about leadership. Uh, uh, I don't know, because as you mentioned, Colombia is a decades of conflicts and with the, together with leadership change, uh, with new worldview and approach to conflict and give chance to peace. Um, Cambodia, especially Prime Minister Hun Sen, used to tell uh, SAC leader, uh, the Tamadao, Ming Ong Liang, don't regard uh, your enemy as terrorist because you will come to the negotiation table one day. <laughs> so that's, yes. And but, that's uh, a I, very um, wise words, of course, and I, which I think the Tamadao should uh, follow on that advice. Because like you said, and as I've said as well, if you continue to regard these armed groups as terrorists, then peace negotiations will never go forward. Um, neither group will agree on that. And it's just, it's not constructive if you keep labeling them as terrorist groups. It's kind of you close or shut down the door for future negotiations. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, so, so very wise words from him. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, from your assessment on the Cambodian efforts as a chair of ASEAN in, in, in Myanmar uh, crisis, uh, you also mentioned about the five-point consensus of ASEAN, which also include humanitarian assistance and uh, the protection of civilians uh, uh, in, in Myanmar, because uh, also they, they don't use the, the term humanitarian law, respect humanitarian law, but uh, 
this uh, kind of the cessations uh, of violence against the uh, uh, civilian is I think it's it's a part of uh, uh, it's part of the humanitarian law. So what what is your assessment and view on on Cambodia's role as a chair of ASEAN in dealing with Myanmar crisis and what is the prospect uh, of that? I think um, this is a difficult position for anyone, and especially now that um, Cambodia is the chair of ASEAN this year, especially with the recent developments such as the execution just um, right after the um, foreign minister meetings. Um, I think ASEAN, uh, I, excuse me, I think Cambodians' position on this is um, understandable and um, it, like I said, it is a difficult, difficult position for anyone. I mean, ASEAN as an organization and this group of states were formed to prevent any confrontation between states. Therefore, Cambodia as chair, we need to thread lightly, as which um, the Prime Minister Hun Sen has been doing well so far. Um, tread lightly in this um, area, but at the same time, we, he um, released a statement that it is also not um, appropriate and not constructive for the uh, Tatmadaw to not be implementing the five-point consensus that ASEAN and Cambodians chair, we are very willing to assist um, Myanmar in this um, issue. Now it is only up to them. But of course, the challenge um, going ahead for ASEAN and Cambodia as chair is if Myanmar is still not implementing the five-point consensus going forward, and if the situation worsens, then what will ASEAN do as a group? Keep in mind that in the ASEAN Charter, there's no mechanism to suspend or invoke a membership from a, a member, since this is not a security, um, uh, it's not a security coalition. It's merely for cooperation. So that is the challenge that we are facing going ahead. What is to do about Myanmar since there is no mechanism to, um, to punish or to invoke their membership of ASEAN? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, interesting point here. So there's some kind of legal loopholes, whether it is a weakness or a strength with regards to the, uh, this kind of uh, the ASEAN charter principle and, and purposes. And uh, next year, of course, uh, Indonesia try to revise the ASEAN Charter, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not sure whether it's, it's, a, it's like opening and and uh, a, a kind of a Pandora box or or not. But uh, I, I I think so. I th I think uh, I agree with uh, what you said. It might be opening Pandora box. I mean, in 2012, when ASEAN Charter was adopted, this international community and the regional situation were very different back then. So now different members might have different um, priorities. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, I'm not sure if <laughs> that <laughs> will work, but we will see. <laughs> yeah. So uh, since you're also doing research uh, on Southeast Asian, uh, I mean, uh, uh, response to, to this kind of dynamics of international law, um, I just would like to, to uh, add uh, one question here uh, with regards to uh, uh, the principle of non-interference here, uh, uh, you think it, it is uh, remain a viable option in international relations, especially in Southeast Asia, to adhere to the non-interference principle? That is definitely one of the cardinal principle um, that regulates the relations in, well, in all over the world, but mostly so in Southeast Asia. ASEAN was created to prevent interferences from uh, external regions and from each other as well. They vow to not interfere in each other's internal affairs. It is in every um, treaty, in, in, in every document they have adopted. But of course, like you mentioned, is, is it still viable today? Um, that is a very complicated matter because there are multiple issues today that are transnational, that it is not merely an internal issue anymore. For example, with Myanmar, with the refugee situation, it is spilling all over Southeast Asia. Are we not allowed to say anything, but now it is um, reaching our borders? So in my opinion, I think it should be relaxed. 
states should be able to discuss these um, sensitive um, topics without being accused of in interfering into each other's internal affair. Of course, anything short of sending your military armed forces into another state should be, should be accepted in today's um, globalized world. Everything we do affects each other. So complete, um, absolute non-interference, in my opinion, is not viable any longer. States should work together since issues, like I said, they are mostly always transnational in nature nowadays. Great point. Thank you uh, for that. I, I think uh, this is something that's very critical to international relations in a multiplex world order yeah. because the, a lot of gray zone, gray area and the issue become more interconnected. But because all the nations have become more interconnected and interdependent, and so we should not ignore what's going on yes. in our neighbor's hood. Uh, there's uh, some comments on, on Facebook here with regards to a uh, human rights situation in Myanmar before the coup and after the coup. Uh, maybe you can share a bit on that, uh, uh, on the human rights situation in Myanmar. Well, before the coup, um, the situation in Myanmar was more or less well, more stable than it is now. Before, the armed conflicts were mostly with the ethnic armed groups, like I said, such as the um, um, Kachin army or in the Shan state. But after the coup, it is anarchy, to say the least. Now, the military is openly targeting civilians, um, civilians uh, populations if they are seen to be uh, anti tatmadaw so it is definitely worse than before. So, so, so situation now, I mean, after the coup, it's getting worse uh, than before. Uh, so that so that is a response to the, the comments from our audience here. So uh, uh, my question to you, uh, Dr. Ned, uh, with regards to against um, uh, the regional context, Southeast Asia, uh, that uh, we, we need to handle many uh, emerging hot stone issues. I, I use the hot stone because Prime Minister Hun Sen uh, used yes. it to refer to certain issue that it's not hot potato because <laughs> it's hot potato you still can eat, but hot stone you cannot eat. <laughs> so, so those are hot stone issues. Yeah. And and uh, of course, um, uh, uh, Cambodia as a small state, uh, we try to uh, advocate for a, a rule-based international order. And our response to the war in Ukraine, the Russia invasion of Ukraine, also based on that principle of international law, uh, because uh, they respect the sovereignty and territory integrity of independent states. And Cambodia does not uh, su uh, support the separatist movement uh, to, to uh, create an uh, independent state within the states. So, so that is kind of the worldview of, of Cambodia. So now uh, with regards to this uh, kind of Cambodia foreign policy, on a humanitarian law and, and rule-based international order here. Do uh, uh, you think that uh, Cambodia is consistent or, or need to do any uh, additional works uh, to get international community to enhance the international law and rule-based international order? Um, thank you for that. Uh, yes, I think um, Cambodia as a small state, um, especially in this very, complicated um, world order at the moment, <clears throat> we, we are respecting the sovereignties of states and <clears throat> we do not agree with separatist movement, which is, um, I think is appropriate. If you start to um, support the separatist movement, then separatist movement will rise everywhere, then the world will be anarchy. And I think what we can do at um, national, regional and international level is that at the moment we are um, respecting international law principles and that is um, the most we can do. And of course we can uh, assist our members of in the Southeast Asia region as well by help assisting others through ASEAN, for example, in helping in complying with those rules. I think that is the most we can do. We cannot force other states to follow in our conduct as well. We could lead by example, which is um, what we are doing now. Wow, uh, a very, very uh, interesting term you, you use, uh, leading by example. Uh, 
when it comes to uh, the respect to, of uh, humanitarian law and rule-based international order, because some country may just have a statement, but they act differently. So of perhaps action yes. uh, speak louder than words. Yes, of course. So, so that, that, that is leading by example. Yes. Uh, we, we have some uh, comments here with regards to uh, uh, um, the, the ASEAN, ASEAN uh, and uh, international human train law. Uh, what should ASEAN do more? And uh, with regards to, uh, as I, I think uh, the, the question earlier, uh, the the peace uh, keeping up operation. Uh, for for your information, uh, uh, the the Ministry of Defence of Cambodia is drafting a concept proposal on uh, empowering, not empowering, but support, uh, strengthening the support mechanism for women peacekeeping okay. forces. So because uh, here uh, uh, this year Cambodia very uh, active in promoting women security and peace agenda, which somehow also connected to uh, humanitarian law when it comes to the protection of civilian and women and children are the most vulnerable groups in armed conflicts. So by having a women peacekeeping forces, they, they may better understand women and uh, better protect uh, the women and so on. So, so that is the you know um, uh, Cambodian efforts this year. So now uh, look at the ASEAN as, as a regional organization when it comes to women peace security agenda and when it comes to uh, human trian law. Uh, what should as ASEAN do more? Again, um, according to ASEAN Charter and the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, when it comes to principles of international law, ASEAN is very specific that it. Um, supports uh, the um, principles of sovereignty, non-interference into the internal affairs of each, um, of each other, of um, each members. Therefore, for them to enforce um, international humanitarian law and other international law, it is, they do not have the um, enforcement mechanism. Even their ASEAN um, Human Rights Intergovernmental Commission, it only has the right to um, monitor um, the activi activities of um, the member states. It does not have the authority or right to investigate or prosecute those who violate um, human rights law or international law. Therefore, if ASEAN is to play a bigger role in um, promoting and implementing international law, it needs to revise its powers and mechanisms in the ASEAN Charter, which as we both agree, it's going to be a very complicated matter. Very, very interesting comments on that. So, uh, so since uh, we we uh, now running out of time, we still have a uh, uh, three four minutes left uh, before we proceed to the conclusion of the uh, lecture series uh, this month. Uh, I would like to seek your kind of a policy recommendations uh, for uh, particularly for uh, Cambodia at the national level and for the international community in general uh, with regards to advancing international human twin law. Um, so so your, your suggestion or policy recommendation on that. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, my uh, recommendation for uh, Cambodia in um, implementing hum inter international humanitarian law, I think at the basic level would be to um, educate our people, our civil societies, our armed forces, as well um, and, and um, all peacekeeping forces so that not, for example, like you mentioned that Cambodia is trying to create a women's peacekeeping force. If we are to educate um, the armed forces efficiently and the right way, then even the men would know how to conduct these peacekeeping um, missions um, respectfully um, to women and children. So I think the basic level and to, it sounds simple, but I to just spread the information and education on the principles that I've mentioned of international humanitarian law to our civil societies, our general populations and armed forces so that it is stuck in their consciousness, even during peacetime and going forward, so that it is like the second nature for them, for when they are carrying out um, missions. For the international community in general? 
the international community, um, when it comes to implementing um, international humanitarian law, I would suggest that states should become impartial, it's not just state, especially the UN Security Council, since they are a super um, security body, they should not continue to be gridlocked due to personal politics. Because of this, international law and international humanitarian law are rendered useless, like I said, because um, there's nobody to enforce it. And when they do enforce it, there are a lot of claims of double standards, which most of the time it is an appropriate claim as well. So it is a difficult um, suggestion, but yes, for the body to act as an um, impartial body in order to regulate international humanitarian law in the international community. Thank you very much, Dr. Ned Kantima, for very insightful, inspiring uh, conversations today. And I hope our audience uh, listening us uh, online and, and in Zoom uh, could get some key takeaways from this talk. But my key takeaway would be that we're still hopeful that uh, uh, more improvement uh, will take place, uh, but with the conditions that uh, we need to educate the public, uh, educate the policymakers uh, with regards to the importance of humanitarian laws. And then we need to be more impartial uh, with regards to implementing uh, international humanitarian law and put people at the center of your decision making, not your selfish interests, so that our humanity will have brighter future. So this is a, it's kind of a, a word of wisdom from uh, Dr. Ned Tida Chantima. Yeah. And for Cambodia as a small state, uh, we need to be uh, uh, more proactive in, uh, in promoting international law and be a role model uh, in, in this regard. So uh, actions speak louder than words. So, so those are some of the key takeaways. And but... Uh, from the presentation, you can see a challenges, many challenges that yeah. Dr. Ned Chantima have raised, but uh, we are still optimistic because we, we are, we, <laughs> that's why, that's why, that's one of the reasons why Dr. Ned Chantima study international humanitarian law, <laughs> being aware that it's very challenging. Yes. <laughs> it, but you still study it. So you still yes. have hope. You still have yes. hope uh, yes. that uh, our human kinds uh, will embrace uh, this principle international humanitarian law. So for the interest of all uh, humanity, because we all are human beings, homo sapiens. So without uh, you know, uh, further uh, delay, I would like to call to the end of this lecture. And so once again, thank you, Dr. Ned Chantima uh, for a wonderful yes. talk today. And we hope to see you in person again in Cambodia. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, because, you uh, will. currently thank you're you. still based in London. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. And thank you all for the questions and participation in this public lecture series. Thank you very much. See you next thank time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Thank